Oh, okay, thank you very much for, for those introductions. I think, actually, um, uh, Matt just gave a very good introduction to part of what I'm going to talk about, because I will be speaking quite a bit about the work of Auguste Perret, who was a, uh, in some ways a contemporary of Le Corbusier's. They never worked together. Uh, they did have a correspondence, and Le Corbusier is, is said to be uh, very much influenced by uh, Perret's use of reinforced concrete, and especially um, exposed reinforced concrete. Uh, I'm talking today a little bit about uh, thin shell concrete architecture, uh, and I'm starting here with what I would say is the received wisdom about the invention of thin shell concrete, that it was said to be invented by um, uh, Bowersfeld, Dykerhoff, and Widman, uh, and Franz Dischinger around 1925. Um, and what what I'm going to claim is that what what people really mean when they talk about this is uh, the uh, analytical calculation of thin shell concrete was invented around that time because in keeping with the book that Paul just uh, mentioned in, in uh, my introduction, uh, these structures were being designed empirically uh, a couple decades at least uh, before the appearance of, of, uh, of, of this kind of work. And I think, oops, wrong button. Uh, so, so this is an example. I'm going to come back to this just a little bit later of some of Perret's work uh, in in warehouses in Morocco, and, and there were a number of these. And and then this is also uh, uh, coupled with some of the churches that Perret did that had some of the characteristics of thin shell concrete. And then uh, this is another instance. This this excuse me. This is the church that I was just showing you, the church of uh, Saint Therese in Montmagny near Paris. And this this is curious because the roof is actually not thin shell when you look at the top of the roof. What is thin shell in this building? Thin shell concrete is the, uh, is the foundation. So there's this kind of inverse vaulted foundation in this building. Uh, so, so this brings me back to uh, this question that we would have to ask when we talk about uh, thin shell concrete structures is really what we mean by a thin shell concrete structure. And it's very hard uh, to characterize this exactly. I think there are ideas in people's minds, especially when they talk about this 1925 invention of this structural type, I th that we're talking about uh, analysis. And we're talking about three-dimensional analysis. And so we're talking about structures that somehow uh, behave in three dimensions and, and are built out of concrete and, and uh, where the support is actually the, the shell structure itself. I'm pointing out this quotation that I think is very relevant uh, from Thomas Kuhn, that it really is not necessarily helpful to our understanding of history to look for the inventor of things or the person who first discovered things. Kuhn was talking about science and, and how extraordinarily difficult it would be to pinpoint um, who, who invented a concept I mean, such as virtual work for engineers, I mean, there are things that hint at it that, that you can read in um, 18th century texts, although, I mean, it wasn't really stated explicitly until a lot later. And then certainly in construction, we have exactly the same thing. There are a lot of kinds of structures that could be called uh, thin shelled that don't necessarily arise out of calculations of three-dimensional structures or that have um, that have features that, that we don't um, necessarily equate uh, with thin shell structures. So this is sort of showing the variety of the kinds of thin shell structures that we can have. This is um, the hyperbolic paraboloid structure, which was nearly always stiffened along the edges. So in addition to the thin shell, we have stiffening beams along the edges. Uh, we have, uh, for instance, the Rivergate Convention Center in New Orleans, uh, obviously uh, demolished uh, a long time ago, that, that's beam supported. So the vaults that you look at in here actually have beams at the supports, although um, most of the work of Jack Christensen would be acknowledged as thin-shelled construction. Um, there's the widely uh, dispersed designs of uh, Anton Tedesco, who was a representative of the Zeiss Dewey Dag system in the US that are called thin-shelled, although they, they have, again, these obvious stiffening ribs. Um, for instance, on, uh, on this hangar, that with a span of 300 feet, and then coming back to um, to, to Jack Christensen, 
the Seattle King Dome, again, a, a, another building that's been demolished that, of course, um, has uh, has very large stiffening ribs. So, I mean, these don't help us in terms of trying to define a thin shell structure as a self-supporting thin concrete shell um, that acts in three dimensions. And so, uh, I, I prefer, again, to, to think of uh, what is the evolution of this kind of building and where does it come from. And again, I'm returning to Auguste Perret because um, I think as um, as Paul said in his introduction, I've just spent a long time in France, and so I'm particularly interested in French architects and engineers um, who who built, a, uh, and I'll show it again, he built a series of um, docks and hangars uh, in Morocco, actually, that um, that used construction that we would almost have to call thin shell. Now, lurking behind uh, Auguste Perret is this uh, very obscure figure of Louis Julusso, uh, who is an engineer that uh, that also uh, is known to have worked with Perret. There's almost nothing uh, in the archives of, of Perret and his work that bears this person's signature, uh, although he, he also, I mean, he was independent in a lot of ways. He wasn't really an employer, a dependent of, of Perret, and he wrote uh, a very, very long article on the analysis of two-dimensional uh, arched structures not necessarily in concrete in the um, in this French civil engineering magazine uh, I'm not showing you all 30 pages of calculations that are involved in looking at these curved uh, or parabolic shapes uh, that, that could be used um, but but rest assured that they're there now I don't have proof one way or the other um, but uh, and so I mean I, I think that really remains to be seen. But, but my basic sense is that Jalousso was not really using his 20-page article on the calculation of um, segmental arch or parabolic arch structures or something when, uh, and, and it is presumably him that provided uh, the, the, the uh, structural solution uh, for some of these, um, for some of these docks of parades. And, and typically, uh, they, they have a span, this has a span of seven meters, and the concrete uh, thickness in, in these uh, vaulted roofs, the concrete thickness is five centimeters. Uh, and so, I mean, it's very hard not to call this a thin shell. I mean, it works in two dimensions. It's beams, oops, I didn't mean that was supposed to be a pointer. It's beam supported, and uh, I think calculations would show that that beam is intended to carry the entire weight of the, of the shell, which is not like um, 1970s. Uh, thin shell uh, concrete structures, but I mean it, it's just hard not to call a structure like that a thin shell uh, with with those kinds of proportions. And then this is uh, what a section through that building looks like. Uh, excuse me, the date of this one was uh, 1917, uh, well before the 1920s dates were given for the invention of the thin shell. And um, he, he d did further further such buildings um, also in uh, in Morocco. Um, for for dock structures, and again before 1925. W one of the more interesting of these buildings is also one of the smallest of them of, of these dock structures, but it has this shape, and it has a central thin shelled vault. It has a central thin shelled vault and transverse segmental vaults alongside of it, uh, which could be possibly the model for Perret's most famous building, which is the. Um, the, the uh, Notre Dame de, de la Consolation that's in Laurency in France. Again, that's well worth a visit. Hop on the red line and, uh, and you can... <laughs> okay. uh, but but it, it has a central, it's got a central vault that's, a, that's a segmental and it's supported or buttressed by these transverse uh, segmental, uh, se segmental vaults also. So it has very, very similar construction to that. And then um, Finally, there's the uh, 1923 uh, warehouse, and again, they're, they're just very similar proportions. Six to seven meter bays, uh, three to five centimeter thickness, and, uh, and segmental arches over the vaults. Um, there's a, a factory that also has vaulted roofs um, a little bit north of Paris that's been written about by Guy Lambert, who's a, a, a Paris scholar of, of, uh, of great repute. But again, it has this, this kind of, uh, these trademarks of 
uh, very thin concrete vaulted roofs. And um, the, the, the historians talk about how he, he uh, Perret again, might have gone from um, work factory sheds to vaults and, and how that might have worked. Okay, so um, when he talked to me about, about giving a talk at this session, and I would certainly appreciate that honor, uh, Paul said, give it, a, uh, give it a Boston angle. Okay, well, I haven't done that very well so far. Uh, but I'm going to give you, in a sense, what I've talked about is how uh, things that we might not think of as thin-shelled concrete uh, may be thin-shelled concrete. And then I'm going to talk about, uh, here's my Boston angle, I'm going to talk about a structure that everyone calls, including, I mean, the website for MIT, that everyone calls a thin-shelled concrete structure that in some ways may not be so much of a thin-shelled concrete structure. And again, this is a, a very important landmark structure designed by um, Eero Saarinen, well known for the TWA Flight Center, which we also had a very brief look at uh, earlier in this session. Um, it, it attracted a lot of architectural attention when, um, uh, when it was designed. And, and here's this uh, wonderful illustration from architectural record showing the shape of Kresge Auditorium uh, possibly as a lady's hat or a baby's diaper or, uh, or, or birds flying through the sky. And so there it is. Okay. So, I mean, it, it was, I think, conceived of as a thin shell. It was conceived of practically a self-supporting um, triangular cutout of, of a sphere. And, I mean, I, I saw a really interesting talk yesterday, actually, at MIT about the construction of the Sydney Opera House, where, again, um, th that history is pretty well known, that, that it was very hard to put a structure on it, but the architect conceived of it as a section of a sphere and said, okay, it'll hold up. <laughs> and we, we have almost the same thing going on here. This is, of course, the centering uh, that was required to, to build this structure. And um, th th there's some really interesting photos in the MIT archive about the construction of this building because... <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm in company of concrete experts. We could spend a half an hour talking about what's going wrong uh, in this project. It's amazing. I mean, you know, look at the size of those bars and the amount of cover and how they're maintaining cover. And, and then this is my favorite. Okay, look at the look on that guy's face. <laughs> it's something like, don't photograph me making a mess out of this structure. Okay, anyway, so there's our, uh, I mean, so these are some of the issues that, that, um, that had to be dealt with during construction. But of course, the worst of the issues that, that they had in construction is that, that this started sagging as soon as they removed, uh, as soon as they removed the centering. And, and the fault was really um, the capacity of these arches at the, at the edges. I mean, because there really wasn't sufficient thickness. And, the, you know, the final outcome of this, um, it's a it's a very faint drawing, but this is also in the MIT archives. This is a, a window mullion. This is a modified structural window mullion. It's made out of one inch thick plate all the way around. And effectively, they had to insert that kind of structure so that the windows would end up supporting the edges of the shell. I mean, again, uh, highlighting my point that things that might look like thin shells aren't necessarily thin shells and the other way around. And so... Again, we have to define what we're talking about and, and uh, the, the, the idea of chronology and invention and attribution is really very difficult and it's better not to do that, uh, which is, I'm sorry, that's anticipating one of my conclusions. That's, that's what it says. It's more illuminating um, to describe the experimentation that appeared before uh, some of the structures that we know about. Um, and again, uh, highlighting the point that's in, um, in the book that uh, I, I hope you can take an interest in uh, empirically designed shells were constructed before rationally uh, before methods were available to calculate uh, stresses in thin shells, and um, Auguste Perret was certainly a pioneer in this area. So, thank you. <laughs>